everyone, and welcome to episode 467 of the MTG Goldfish Podcast. I'm Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, and we have the full crew here this week, kicking things off with the owner of MTG Goldfish, Richard. How are you this fine Monday, Richard? Good morning, Seth. I'm doing well. I was just grinding with my free moto collection. We got to drop that Ooh. in here at the beginning of the cast. We got to drop oh, yeah, that in. That's... That's that is worth mentioning. There is, I believe, today and tomorrow because of some uh, magic online issues over the weekend where they were unexpectedly down for like a whole day. There's a code. Oh, do you know the code, Richard, off the top of your head? Repair. Oh, I tweeted I, it's about just it. on the, I think it's it's on the re- homepage. It's repair. OK, it's repair. I think it's repair. But if you put the code repair in in the Moto store, they're giving you literally all the cards. You can play with all of them until tomorrow afternoon, I think. So if you've been waiting for a chance to try out Magic online or like play some vintage or legacy or something super expensive, you get to do it for free right now. So definitely check that out. But we got another co-host in Krim. Good morning, Krim. How are you today? Morning. I am happily not playing on moto uh, so hello how are you <laughs> doing doing well i'm excited for today's cast because uh this is a fish mail bag cast so a couple of weeks ago on the youtubes i put out the the call for fish mail questions and you know fish mail we try to do it every week but sometimes we're busy we're getting into spoiler season next week and when the cast goes long we don't get to it so we've heard your request to make sure we get in the fish mail so today we're dedicating essentially the entire cast to answering your questions we got a bunch of really good ones thank you to everyone who sent them in before we get into it though a quick reminder that today's show is brought to you by card conduit and card conduit's the easiest way to sell your magic cards and if you ever get tired of the hassles of buy listing You can skip them with Card Conduit. You can use their curated service and send it as many cards as you want with a buy list value of a dollar or more and pay just a 5% service fee. And if you want to do a bit of work, you can use a sorted service where you list and sort your cards in advance and pay just a 2% fee. Either way, you'll get a detailed report with the results and a fast payment once the order is processed. And you can even get another 10% off by heading over to cardconduit.com slash mtggoldfish. Card Conduit, they're the easiest way to sell your magic cards. So thank you to Card Conduit for supporting the show. Of course, you can also check out the Patreon or pick up some stuff at the merch page if you like any of that stuff. But anyway, with our sponsorship stuff out of the way, let's answer some fish mail. And Richard, I'm going to kick it to you. Why don't you guide us through some uh, wonderful questions? All right. So uh, I think we've accumulated a lot of fish mail. We're going to go through them. But before we do, Seth gave me hosting duties today. Because I tricked him into doing it so I could spread the good word of Jund. Okay, I got an update for you guys. I, Wait, I, I, need, you a, I need a ninja in this topic. Uh, from the Codfather, uh, uh, can you tell me if Jund is good and modern? Well, like the Codfather, I can. Let me, let me get you a, a little DM I got over the, over the weekend. Seth was like, Richard, NT is Bob 2.0. Okay? NT, Seneschal of the Sun, 2 mana, 2-2. Two, two. It's a red 2 drop. Whenever you attack, you may discard a card. You put a plus one, plus one counter on target attacking creature. It gains trample until end of turn. Whenever you discard one or more cards, exile the top card of your library. You may play that card until your next end step. And, you know, Jund has Liliana, so you can ditch cards, play them with Inti. Uh, there, there's actually a post on Reddit, I think this morning, asking if Tarmogoyf had trample, would that fix Tarmogoyf? And the people are like, well, it would be banned if it had trample. <laughs> and uh, trample would fix Tarmogoyf. Re- it would be really strong. So I'm like, Inti sounds good. I went to a league, Seth. Guess what my record is? <laughs> uh, for, for Did you finish the league? Huh? Or you're still, did you finish the league? Oh, yeah, you're still league in is it? finished. Okay, four, four and one, four and one. Zero five. It is hot trash, Seth. No! <laughs> it, is not, it, it is not mocked with Dread Knight oh, at God. all. There were so many games where oh, I'm no. like, if this was <laughs> anything else, I'd win. It <laughs> okay. just it comes down, <laughs> dies instantly. Okay. It, it actually dies to Doom Blade. Uh, if you untap <laughs> it, you don't snowball out of control. It's legendary. <laughs> so if you have multiples, uh, it, it doesn't, oh, it, yeah. you, can't, you can't stack them and go. It, it needs support. Like, if you are top decking at the end of the game and you draw an Inti, you are very sad. Uh, the, the ideal scenario is you have a Goyf, you play Inti, you give it Trample, you, you run all over Orcish Bowmasters, call it a day. But otherwise, it sucked. And there were so many games where I was like, if this was a Dread Knight, I would I would have just straight up won. I just got, like, mm. outgrinded into the ground mm. and Inti did nothing. Ugh. And Exile is yeah. not drawing, okay? Like, when you Exile your removal and your opponent has an empty board, you're like, okay. 
hit you for three. <laughs> and then, you know, like you, you just lost the card in the process and you don't have it in your hand anymore. And then the next turn they play their haymaker and then you get destroyed. So mm. sounded good on paper. That's- that's but, disappointing. Uh, disappointing. Disappointing. <laughs> I, Bosswood Dread Knight is still where it's at, Seth. <laughs> it's still the still the truth. I've seen NT be very good in Pioneer. People play it with Smuggler's Copter, and that's kind of like the synergy is like NT Crew's Copter. You get the like double looting and all this stuff. It seems really good there, but maybe maybe modern uh, the builds of John just can't actually support it. So well, back to Mosswood Dread Knight. At least we got Mosswood Dread Knight to hold down uh, <laughs> the fort in 2024, John. So many four ones over the holidays. So many, I got, I, I, I four won so, so many close. leagues, and I was so sad. I, I was trying to get the five zero to uh, have Siege Rhino uh, live on infamy <laughs> on FTG Goldfish. All right, oh, it'll I bet, I bet you, you would have gotten five zero if you had a play set of something that wasn't Mosswood Dread Knight. Crib, you, you're not a believer. You, you play, it and you, I, I, you will convert immediately. I, I tried <laughs> it in Timeless. I tried it in Timeless, and I'm like, yo, this is harsh. I don't know. Like, I, I die pretty hard. <laughs> and on top of that, I feed Bowmaster. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <sighs> you got to see. I, I was like you once. I thought it was a meme. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is actually the truth. I, I actually now have to start Judd with four Goifs and four Dread Knights. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. uh, <laughs> it's actually the uh, second most important card in Judd because Lily uh, is. <laughs> That's so good. Okay. <laughs> Back, back to like real topics here. Okay. Colin Crow 5616. Uh, Lost Caverns of Ixalan and Murders at Karloff Manor are different from other return sets in that they feature very different mechanics and focus on a part of the world we didn't see much the previous times. Uh, what are some ideas for backdrop sets uh, you think could be cool in the future? A tournament arc on Kaladesh where competitors build big robot mechs to fight each other. A bad guy uses... Omen paths to put slivers on Ikoria where they mutate out of control and become an invasive species. Feels like there's a lot of potential here. <sighs> Ooh. Yeah, there probably is a lot of potential here, isn't there? Like, if you can do murder mystery, guildless Ravnica, you can do, you can do anything you want at that point. Oh, that's a really good question. Hmm. While do you guys thinking, have an answer let, to this question? This. I, I actually dislike this concept. <laughs> really? I, so I, I think I'm going to give you a battle for Zendikar, okay? You're like, okay, it's return to Zendikar. We're going to see Zendikar things. I'm so hyped for Zendikar. And then Wizards was like, surprise, it's actually an Eldrazi set. And then everything you know and love about Zendikar just simply didn't exist in battle for Zendikar because it was an Eldrazi set. So the... The problem wasn't it was, it was Eldrazi. The problem was the expectation, right? The expectation was I was going to Zendikar, and instead I went to this Eldrazi thing. Uh, we'll see how they do with, with Karloff Manor. But, like, people think Ravnica, they're, like, guilds and, and guild yeah. leaders and, and this war thing and, you know, whatever, whatever Ravnica means to you. But if they go off and it's, like, this super weird clue thing, uh, I don't like it. Like, same with the... Same with the uh, the wedding in Innistrad, right? It's like, that's not what you were thinking when you were thinking Innistrad. And it technically works. And it's probably a fine concept, but the expectation is not met. So I, I think you really? could do it, though. So, like, go back to... Go back to, like, uh, Battle for Zendikar, which I think is the best example so far of, like, a return set flopping because it didn't meet expectations. But what if instead of what it was, which was like Eldrazi mostly and bad cards, what if it like focused on allies or something very like a niche aspect of our first Zendikar that still had like the flavor and so forth. I'd be down with that, right? Like a return to Zendikar, but rather than being just like this broad set, it's focused like narrowly on the allies, which were like a popular part of our first visit to Zendikar, but like a very small subset of the set. So I think there are ways that you could make it work or like go to Kamigawa, but have it focus on Zubera, my favorite underrated creature type that never gets any respect like i would i would play a set of kamigawa that was just like chilling with the zubera doing whatever they're doing so i think it is possible to do it right but wizards doesn't always do it right i mean kamigawa is the doing it right i think i I don't know like i feel kamigawa is well recepted and it has nothing to do with original kamigawa really right they're just like well let's flash forward to the future and uh, here we are with the cyberpunk ninjas and rogues or whatever and it was fine so yeah maybe if you do it correctly it would work. Yeah. 
should, should, I mean, should like, we should we isekai things into <laughs> into our worlds, Grim? Should we uh, t- turn Kaladesh I, into a Gundam show? Like, what do we? <laughs> I, I I actually think that it, it it's because like how big these worlds are, right? Like, you, there's you don't see every part of that world. So like I b- totally believe that there could be this, I don't know, another sector of Ravnica or whatever, right? That that just happens to have I don't know, like like yeah, like Gundams going on or something like that. Uh, uh these kind of sets could work. I, I I like it, but I don't know. It it all comes down to how they execute it, right? Because I like the idea of Markov Banner or Karlov Banner. <laughs> uh, but uh, like, yeah, like it's Karlov, Karlov, Karlov Mark is in his drop. Karlov, <laughs> yes. But I... it's uh, like, like this, this is this was hard for me. I, I, I honestly just could not stop calling it Markov Manor. So, like, I first off, I'm surprised that there is. I keep getting shocked. There's no Kar- like Soren. So, <laughs> like, like I'm like, wait, hold on. What's okay, going okay, on? wait, wait, wait. But, so, what, what plane are but, we due to return to? Uh, we could come up with one right now. Let's see. Ooh. Uh, Theros. Hmm. Or is it time to return to Theros? <laughs> I think uh, we. I think we already had Theros beyond death. We just well, returned okay. to Ixalan. I mean, we could what, go to. What about the, 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 the Can we lore go to person again? No, 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 no. <laughs> we we just the, literally had wolves. <laughs> oh yeah, because I guess that's true. We could go back to Ikoria. Okay, but I don't Ikoria. know what. Let's choose Ikoria. Okay, let's choose Ikoria. Ikoria. Hit us. We'll each come up with a, a new theme, and we can't use slivers mutate out of control. <laughs> what what happens on? Uh, oh oh no, a... this is so hard. Eldron. Okay, if it's Godzilla, then you just get another big baddie to come and fight Godzilla, which would be what the Eldrazi. Uh, how about universes beyond? How about we throw some Evangelion in there? And they just come in. The okay. angels start attacking Ikoria. Ooh. It, it's, Ooh that, okay. Okay. Or, or, or how about we go like total opposite? Actually, on Ikoria, there's these little mammals. And they're like monkeys or something. And they're trying to survive in a world of giant dinosaurs. And one day, maybe 500 million years later, they'll take over Ikoria and rule the world. But you today, the apes. they're fought. Planet of the Apes. Oh, Planet <laughs> of the Apes. Planet of the Apes. That'd be perfect. Literally, you just do that, I guess. What about but, what about like mutating humans? Because that's the whole thing of Ikoria, right? What if the well, in like the mutations, like, but we didn't really see that happen to humans for the most part, did we? It was all like these monsters and beasts. Ravnica. I'm thinking like Futurama, the mutants that like live under yeah. under the city. We well, what about that? Futurama universes beyond Ikoria crossover. <laughs> That would be cool. Like, you know how many times I've tried to mutate a human? <laughs> you I just know. think it works, right? But like, actually, oh, that, nope. that would have been bad. Like the fly, get some more yeah. Jekyll. Ooh, over. yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. I'm down for an Ikoria return. I'm down for an Ikoria return. No companions, um, though. That's my one rule. Oh, yeah. No that's right. That's the companion set. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. Uh, Michelin Man, what do you think? Your greatest flaw as a magic player is. Cool. I think I I think I know mine. I think for me, I I think I'm too patient sometimes and that I I wait longer than I should to do things. Like I'm always trying to like play around the counter that they may or may not have. And sometimes that ends up being the right way to play it, but there's also times when as Tomer would say, you just gotta run it out there and make them have it. So I think like Knowing when to just make them have it and take the risk uh, in doing that more often and not just always waiting and waiting and waiting until the opponent finally taps down and then going for it. I think that would be the number one thing for me, just being too patient sometimes. <laughs> for for the current year, I think it's pretty easy for me. I just don't. I think because whenever I, I, I don't take the game seriously, I just don't care. I just click and drag. I don't really do anything. I've gotten too comfortable, too casual almost, if you would. I've gotten too casual. I just don't care. Uh, I'm like, okay, I drag this. Okay, this card lit up. All right, I'll do it. All right, I died. Oh, how could this happen? <laughs> uh, I think I, I never play tier one meta decks. 
And I don't I don't know why I'm just allergic to it. It, it like disgusts me. And like when Jund becomes like <laughs> tier one for that like five seconds in history, I like I don't play Jund. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> right? Like I, like something <laughs> and it's just wrong. Like chance okay. If you want to win stuff, like 99.9% of the time, just take what people perceive to be the best deck is and then go play it. <laughs> like, <laughs> and you, you can probably just grind your way to, you know, your, your uh, you know, PTQ top eight or win with that. But also you need to be grinding that so you know how to beat it. Uh, but like, I just don't like to and like the minute the minute my deck becomes tier one i'm like oh time to play another deck and then i just choose some other like <laughs> random weird jank that i think i could have uh, meta game them out on uh but yeah I don't, I don't know for some reason i'm just allergic to playing like the the number one deck in the format for some reason just I i'm curious why. have you always been like that or is this like a relatively new thing was there ever a time when you would just like jam the best deck or whatever no never, never. i've never like even early in my magic career, uh, I, I never would. And I, I've always had an affinity to weird mid-range stuff. And good thing weird mid-range has always been bad or ambiguous. <laughs> <laughs> like when mid-range is good, like you could probably slap together any mid-range file. So like it's not, you know, it's not usually a consensus top 75 cards. Uh, but yeah, like I never played whatever the top deck in standard. Well, maybe I played mono black. Oh, like Mono Black with Pack one. Rat that era. With pack Rat, yeah. I really liked Pack Rat, and it was funny. Uh, but that was probably the only like tier one deck I played for an actual like extended amount of time. I'm kind of the same way, but then sometimes I will just like for fun pick up like the top deck and see how it goes. And I'm always like, wow, life is so much easier when you just like pull the best deck that wins all the tournaments. I'm like, wow, you win so much more than when you're like trying to brew these janky combos. Like, why don't I do this all the time? But there must be a still, correlation. It just doesn't feel the same, oh, I, right? I, I played Beanstalk when, <laughs> when it first came out. Oh, God. Like, <laughs> what are these free wins like this yeah. guy can't actually beat me i can just do whatever i want like, what is I, this? I, this doesn't matter what i do yeah i'm like i, I had that same experience <laughs> yeah like wow we are not even playing the same game like i'm just throwing my cards everywhere and it's working out <laughs> hogak hogak was also one of the you know, oh. what, what is going on here like what okay yeah i guess this is a thing um cruiser 50143 who is the most competitive person in the group Hmm. This what way is easier this one, a this one is ago. interesting this one's interesting there's only there's only one person that sweats out tournaments at this at this <laughs> yeah i mean krim is the easy answer right although i think even krim is like krim is not that competitive. less competitive than he used to be yeah like he's I'm like, old yeah. now <laughs> yeah like you're not really the tournament grinder anymore but you used to be i never was yeah. the tournament grinder so i don't think it can be me although richard you used to do the grind thing a little bit right like forever ago yeah i, I used to grind tournaments but i don't know i don't really consider myself a competitive player even though People, people, I was like, oh, Richard always talks about winning on on, on Clash podcast. I'm like, what else am I supposed to talk about? Like, I, like yeah. what I like the most, but that's like subjective, yeah. right? <laughs> like, we gotta talk about something objective here. Uh, but like, I actually don't particularly care. But I, I guess like, who was sweatier back in the day? Like, I was probably pretty sweaty though. But I, I would never be like kind of the the bad competitive player like the salty competitive player or the i guess like the rules oh. lawyer competitive player or, or any of the, you know any of those things right but I, I would go to events and i would try to win them but i would also be playing again tier two jank <laughs> so like does that really count like i, I don't know yeah right. <laughs> i mean so then is it me because i feel like i i've gotten so far from competitive like i i am like yeah, whatever. It's cool. <laughs> it, oh. it might still be you, even though I think you're right that you're like not as competitive as before. But like none of us are like super competitive at this point, are we? Maybe it's like Tomer. Is Tomer like sneakily the competitive one, even though he's <laughs> he the budget commander is. guy? <laughs> it might actually be Tomer. <laughs> <laughs> I guess like oh, and then it's like, yeah, maybe maybe it's Tomer. And then of us three that I guess it, it might be me then because I tech. I, I, I got close. I now actually have my standard deck built in paper Ooh, because see. I saw how good <laughs> like 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 the the standard tournament uh tournaments and stuff like that and seeing that standard is like kind of coming back in paper. I've gotten the itch. Oh, I've gotten are the you itch going back to get on the a grind. 
No, 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 no. Because then I gotta wake up early and then go out to these. Like it's like if I have a day off, I'm not. I'm definitely not gonna wake up early to play Magic. I think that's the biggest thing. I don't want to wake up early to do anything. <laughs> like, like I can vouch. I definitely, yeah. <laughs> that's true. I yeah, right. You can vouch. Y'all can vouch. I de if I and if I'm gonna wake up early, I definitely don't want to go into your room and play Magic and and like and like what's the point of me driving 45 minutes, being half asleep and punting my way through the whole tournament? So, so yeah, like I I don't know, but I but I almost almost wanted to, and now I have a paper deck, so I guess I'm the closest. Are are you gonna play in that huge tournament in Chicago, Krim? Like, aren't they doing some big standard thing at the Magic Con in Chicago? They are. You are. Play it? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> because it starts early. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I, I'll tell you how I know I'm super casual. So I, I've been playing One Piece. Okay, and all you need to know for this example hey. is there, there, there is a card. Uh, it's actually Crim's deck where you loot every single turn. Okay. Yeah. And like mm -hmm. old me Sakazuki. would be looking at every card that goes into your graveyard and rethinking what's in your hand and what to play around. Right. You're like, well, if he discards this, that means he must have X, Y, Z two turns. Now I got to do, you know, ABC and blah, blah, blah. Right. I hate playing against that deck because I don't want to look at that. That's like information. And I don't want to have to try to process it. <laughs> and I don't bother <laughs> processing it. And then I get like, Totally Pikachu face, like two turns later, but I get blown <laughs> out from like a very off, like, you know, if they discard the best card in their deck, you know that they have a second one in hand, right? Like, otherwise, why they do this, yeah. right? But like, I don't yeah. want to think about this. And I absolutely hate doing that. So I am so like beyond sweaty now. I'm like, I just can't do it. I'm like, I, I can't, it's like too much, right? I'm like, oh, you're going to an event. Do you want to test for it? I'm like, no. <laughs> we'll, we'll just uh, we'll just figure out the matchup as we go along, you know. Like I don't yeah, wanna, we'll roll in. You know? I don't want to put in the <laughs> hard work of like testing matchups and like figuring out the perfect sideboard plan. Like you know, I, I just I still wing it even with Junt, right? I, I make a sideboard. Like I, I don't know the exact cards going in and out, which is terrible. You need to know exactly what's going in and out for every matchup. Otherwise, why it's in your sideboard? I'm just like, I don't know. Just put this in and take that out and. <laughs> Sometimes I'll put an extra land in because I feel like it rather than mathing it out. <laughs> like it's all casual and disgusting. And I uh, I, I, I love bad that. If I if I look at myself, why should I play this? Because I feel like it. I like <laughs> I that. feel that's, like that's, it. That's 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 where I think we're all at. <laughs> yeah. I think currently. The, the yeah, funniest thing I do is like, can I still five zero by putting this meme card in? <laughs> like how much does it affect my win percentage because it'll be so glorious when people look at this deck list when it goes online <laughs> that, that, I was, that is the funniest moment <laughs> I was looking through Moto deck list today and it was Legacy League results and someone 5-0'd with like some mono red goblin deck and it had brushwag one brushwag in the sideboard and you know they gave up that sideboard slot just to like <laughs> have this <laughs> meme green creature they couldn't even cast in their deck for, for people like me looking at the results so I can respect that <laughs> all right cows five four six what was your job before you became a content creator if you weren't a content creator what other job could you see yourself doing Ooh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> does it have to be a w2 job <laughs> it can, it can be you any can job. interpret this however you want <laughs> okay so then technically before this right okay i, I Technically, before this, I think I worked at some tech company, right? Uh, an, an, uh, a, a social media giant or whatever you want to call it, right? But I th And then prior to that, I was a musician. And I think if I were not doing this, I would be on tour 35-7. I would be doing something music related. Uh, I'd probably return to that or something like that. I cannot picture Krim doing the nine to five at a <laughs> at an actual company. I just cannot wrap my head around Krim living that life. It's the funniest thing to think about. <laughs> I didn't do a nine to five. You see, I did the graveyard shift. Oh, okay, that's that's more Cause, the Krim cause schedule. It, yep. So I got I I got into work at six a.m. and I left at two thirty and I went to bed when I got home. I stayed up at, like I would stream from like nine p.m. to four a.m. And then get ready, go to work, work, come home, sleep. 
So what's wrong yeah, with you in daylight, Crim? I hate the sun, dude. Daylight. Why? Why would I? Why would I? Want how could you in live your life? How do you do any? How do you like go to the bank? How do you accomplish anything? Automatically, I do it on my phone. I don't gotta. I don't gotta stand in a line. I don't, I don't gotta talk to the post office, Crim. How do you? I'm like, how do you? I don't. <laughs> I what man? Nothing. I can't go and drop off at a random USPS drop box. <laughs> like, uh, but yeah, like I mean, I, I and then also on top of that, yeah, like like being a musician was was easy. I I, I well, okay, it wasn't easy, but but it was fun. <laughs> like like you know, I I played. Uh, I I went pretty far in that. You know, I was able to get on a, a label, do all of that stuff, tour professionally. Uh, that was a there, lot of fun. So there's yeah. a video out there of you on conan right isn't that isn't there that the is. real thing yeah. there's a we, video of crim playing conan <laughs> yeah yeah there's crim on conan uh and all of that stuff and uh <laughs> like yeah like like we like there's there's just lots of my music passed out there so yeah now music is definitely super fun i i mean i played music for fun but i never got to the point of doing it as a full-time job so i started making content pretty much when i finished doing school i was thinking of going to grad school and then the content thing started happening so i worked like a bunch of just random jobs i delivered pizza i worked at one point at a in eggway it's called i don't know if eggways exist in the rest of the world but it's like a an animal like cow food store and horse food store it was like the worst job someone got their arm cut off it was like it was a miserable Wait, cold horrible what physical job. what how do you get your yeah, arm there's cut like, off delivery is this like DoorDash well, no. for animal food? Or this is no, like... no, no. It's like making the food, like grinding oh. the corn into the food oh. to put them in bags to sell to the farmers and stuff. So it was, yeah, like that kind of stuff. So yeah, I worked a ton of like uh, not very great jobs like that. They were, I guess some of them were interesting. If I wasn't doing content, my goodness, I don't know what I would be doing, honestly. I really like this. I mean... I don't know. The other thing I, I always thought I would do something that would help people. So when I got into content, I was thinking of like going to grad school to uh, become like some sort of psychologist or something along those lines. So maybe I'd go back to that. Maybe I don't know if I go back to grad school at this point, but I'd want to do something that was somehow doing good in the world and helping people. And not getting my arms cut off. I can't like imagine that machines. delivering pizza because like... <laughs> There's no, I will there's say like no pizza. Like who are you delivering it to? I've been there, Seth. <laughs> as you far have to as deliver, go to the oh, next you gotta town. So to do far, this? yeah, you do that. You know, there's like 15 mile delivery radius because you got to go to the next town over to get enough people. I will say delivering pizza, as far as bad jobs go, is one of the better bad jobs because you just kind of drive around and listen to music and give people their food. So, uh, is the only downside is if people don't tip you, oh my god, you lose so much money because <laughs> your base wage is very low and they count on people tipping you. So if you don't get tips and you got to pay for your own gas you can end up like losing money delivering pizza which does not feel good that has to that had to have changed right like i don't think so. here oh. <laughs> well i don't know mate. i don't know that was a long time ago mate hopefully it has changed because it's not the best setup for the delivery I mean, don't people, you, don't you sure. simply not have a job now because it's just doordash or whatever like you'd have to be a doordash <laughs> driver now right like i don't see very don't... many pizza places delivering their own pizzas anymore <sighs> see we don't even have doordash here we're so out in the boonies i can't actually get doordash <laughs> so we still actually have pizzerias with delivery drivers to uh to bring us food there's one pizzeria that'll deliver to me here so <laughs> uh i was a software engineer before stuff before goldfish and i would probably do that after I, I i don't know what would i i don't know what i would actually do probably that it's a nice it's a nice cushy job it's a it's a nice like desk job you can do whatever you want kind of like what we do I, now yeah, <laughs> yeah, instead yeah. of talking to other people it's like i don't know it's kind of the same thing like when i'm not making content with you guys i'm just coding and like doing like random yeah. crap i'd be doing at my normal software engineering job uh so it's not I much different in my opinion i don't know if i've ever asked you this so when you started goldfish how nervous were you about going from cushy programming job to like doing your own thing was it like something that was hard and scary or were you just like oh this is gonna work i'm going for it no not really so uh essentially if you work in tech everyone has a midlife crisis 
Okay, where you're like, oh, what am I? <laughs> what am I doing? This happens at like the ripe age of like 26 or something. I don't know, right? But <laughs> essentially, I I actually quit. So you know, goldfish was happening, right? But it was like pretty small back then. I don't even know if you guys are on. You guys are probably on board at that time. At least Seth was on board, but I was just like, I I don't think I was on board for quite a while, dude. I, like, I, I was just gonna quit and grind diablo 4 like that that, like that that was like straight up i was like you know i'm done i'm done working and you know like everyone does this people do more ambitious things but i'm like i'm just gonna sit home and do whatever i want and at that time it happened to be diablo 4 so i guess you can pinpoint the point in time or not diablo, happened, diablo 3 yeah. sorry diablo, diablo 3 4 i was like, no, no, that's like last 3. year Richard. diablo 4 is last year diablo 3 sorry 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 so you know i was whirlwind barbing it up or whatever and then i was like you know, like a, a, a couple of months past, I'm like, okay, now I'm bored. What do I do? I could either go back to my job uh, or I could do goldfish like full time. And at that point, I decided to do goldfish full time. And, you know, we were like quite small at that point and, you know, not really making any money or anything. But I don't know, in my mind, I could always just go back to my, my tech job if I, I needed to. And as, as right. time goes on, that becomes less and less realistic <laughs> right <laughs> but it wasn't like that like a huge scary thing because i was I, yeah. I literally quit to play diablo 3 uh, <laughs> well i well, that, that was not I, the answer i, I, I was quit to do whatever i wanted great. to do and whatever and i wanted happened to, do, to be diablo, happened 3. diablo 3 okay i'm not like oh i gotta i gotta be like diablo 3 world champ or something yeah. right i was just like i don't know so uh, looking back is hilarious though because I felt I didn't have enough time to play video games or something and then I play a lot of video <laughs> games like now I play like zero games uh, yeah. <laughs> now I really have no time so it's it's kind of funny <laughs> oh we got into this a little bit uh, Martin Dragunov 4749 do you have any kind of degrees and what are they so so Seth was actually going to I... go for a doctorate in yeah psychology. I was thinking I was thinking about it. So I have a psychology bachelor's. I was thinking about going, yeah, to grad school to get a to get a master's at least. Uh, but then content happened. So that never happened. I actually like, I don't know. College was weird. I bounced around a lot. I liked a lot of things. I like learning. I actually really like college. I'm someone who just likes likes learning things. Oh, so like, yeah, scholar. I'll do creative writing this semester. <laughs> and then, oh, maybe I'll do business this semester. So I bounced around and took a lot of useless classes and ended up with a psychology degree. <laughs> Arguably, some would say also kind of a pointless degree. Yeah, I, it's a, a relatively I, useless psychology degree, but I, got I the paper. switched off psychology. <laughs> uh, why? So, that was wise of you. <laughs> I switched off psychology because I was studied like, well, Lord of the Rings. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, so, so Did, wait, what was your actual degree then? <laughs> so, well, I, I went, I, I, when I stepped into college, I went in for psychology. Then I was like, well, if I'm going to go into something that makes negative money, I may as well do something I like, you know, like easier. Right. And, and yeah. something I enjoy. So I was like, OK, well, then I'll go into like I went into film from there, specifically oh. screenwriting. And I'm like, OK, cool. Like, you know, like if I'm going to be like forever broke, then I'm going to go at least go into this and be forever broke here. Right. Like and uh, so, yeah, like I went to school for screenwriting and through that, you know, I had to watch miserable things like breaking down Lord of the Rings and why why like this is good. And, like and I'm like, this is not good, but I'll break it down because I think this is what you want to hear. Uh, <laughs> I also remember arguing with my film teacher and like why Iron Man was amazing. <laughs> and like. <laughs> and like, so <laughs> I think in a critical thinking class I had, which within ha ha comment section beat you to it. But you don't critically think, well, you see, let me tell you something. <laughs> there was a point where uh, like it, it was funny. We used Marvel movies as a critical thinking discussion course. I Ooh. like I took that just as an, uh, a nice thing to have, you know, to learn about all the fallacies and stuff like that. And, I don't know. It was just cool to take all these classes because I too like to learn. But then music kind of took off, and then I just I let's not lie here. I there was a point where college in my area, there were so many people enrolled in college there that you actually like like because I went to community college to then college, right? Mm -hmm. So the 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 actual college was so busy and so packed. That you actually, when you enrolled, you had a year off. You were just enrolled at the school, but you couldn't really take classes. Wow. So then, like, so that was in that blip, that that year off, right? I that was when I started the band. Then I went to, then I got into film, right? And then that was when it was like, okay, 
So band's kind of picking up. Yeah, I'm gonna just drop out. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah, gonna how drop do you, out here. How do you give up that chance to tour and yeah. do all that stuff? Yeah. Also, I think there's a second part to that question that Richard asked. Oh yeah, but we'll get to it. Uh, but yeah. I, I wish I had a time machine. So, so one thing I, I actually would really like to do is, is just become a scholar. <laughs> so <laughs> like in Final Fantasy 14? <laughs> no, I don't want to heal could. people all day like, pretending I have okay. other abilities, okay? <laughs> like an academic. <laughs> Give me like a an professor academic, Richard. You know, so we go to college nowadays, which is an institution of learning, but we really treat it as like weird trade school, right? You're you're actually yeah. just getting a degree to get a job. But I want to be one of those like old school people that like just go to learn how the world works. Like, you know, I'm like, I don't yep. know. I'll just learn some philosophy today and then we'll do some mathematics. And like, what is the point of this? There is no point. We're just learning. <laughs> uh, as opposed to today's college where you're just grinding to get big numbers to like go get a job. Uh, so I I wish we had like a scholar profession. And I don't, yeah. the closest thing <laughs> Richard, would be like a PhD or something, right? Like you grind yeah. away writing papers in this rule system and you make no money anyway. And hopefully you contribute <laughs> to the world's knowledge but it's it's like i i don't know it doesn't seem to have the same appeal as like you know the the old greek philosophers or, yeah. or whatever right like you know those old school yeah. renaissance people like just do whatever they want and they're like ah oh, let's learn about flowers today let's let's cut up some uh, bodies and do this whatever right so uh second parter what's our favorite music genre you got you guys did a a oh, patreon video recently <laughs> going over yeah. music what what are your actual yeah. favorite genres did that air okay uh yeah that, <laughs> oh that is did. live you can check that it out on, live the on patreon, patreon. We, we, this is where i first learned about crim on conan as well <laughs> <laughs> conan <laughs> i still uh, yeah that's so funny to me that's uh, that's one of my favorite goldfish stories that crim was randomly on conan for me <laughs> For me, I like, I mean, mostly rock and indie music, but really I've come to appreciate pretty much all genres. I used to like think I didn't like rap, but then I realized I just listened to bad rap that was on the radio and not the good rap. And now I really like some rap musicians. Uh, same with country. I used to think country was like my least favorite genre. But then I found out that mostly it's just the country they play on the radio is really bad. And there's actually some like really talented country artists. But for me, it mostly comes back to like some sort of indie slash rock slash experimental type music. That's my my favorite genre. Uh, I, I think me for me it's probably something i don't know i, I listen to like a, like a lot of stuff as long as there's guitars right but it, it goes it ranges from like pop all the way to like hardcore punk music right like stuff like that so and when i say hardcore punk i mean like literally hardcore the genre but like it's like I don't know. I guess technically I'm not allowed to talk about hardcore music because then it's like that's like anti hardcore, like, you know, anti punk because then it's like Fight Club. If you talk about it, like, you know what I mean? <laughs> that, 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 like, so guess I wouldn't make it in Fight Club. I don't know. So uh, I, I like I like anything that's just got a lot of like raw emotions, like whether like with lyrics, uh, if it's got a breakdown or so I don't I don't actually like breakdowns as much as you would think, but I do love fast aggressive songs so like some of my favorite albums it's like 12 minutes for 20 songs <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like ah finally i've waited four years for this release sit down and by the time my butt's in the chair all right it's over time to go <laughs> so yeah I, I i guess if i were to pick a genre i don't know i uh because I, I the fight club rule i guess i'll choose like pop punk or something like that <laughs> I don't understand talk, any words you, talk about you guys do you, used. <laughs> do you do you even listen to music? What is Richard? pop punk? Like, what is emo punk? What is what is any of the like? I don't. I, you're just throwing words at me. I don't know like, what these. As really long mean. as you uh, know, uh, the, the one thing you need to know, Richard, is that those are not the same genre, right? Like, there, yes, there's, 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 what, what is there's the a difference? Phenomenon. All right, all right. Tell me, okay, what what is punk? <laughs> and what oh, God. Is, okay. what is emo? Punk? Oh no, music you got it for me so, right now. I'm going to have to do this. I'm about to get sweaty here. Okay, this is where I lift up my glasses. Yeah. I've got the anime glare. <laughs> so technically, emo is from the New York hardcore scene that base, is based off of like the genre that was uh, of music created by Rites of Spring. That's emo. I think it's like emo screamo. Like, like, like punk screamo is actually 
like probably what what emo is but when when you think of emo now it's it's like you know uh, uh i don't know what's an emo band like taking back sunday or or something like that um and it's it's associated with eyeliner yada yada all of that but that's like what it became right but but yeah. it, it originally was from new york stuff and it's a lot like right spring and and things like that so uh genre wise it's it, it's it's really splitting hairs because at some points they get kind of close to each other but like as you can figure out you know punk usually a lot more less less commercially accepted like you know music it, it, it sounds aggressive it's it's not for your like it, like easily digesting pleasure it's nothing but circle pits fast chords it's there's a meme you know it's like ah well you know I, I don't know how to play any instruments. And this other person's like, I don't either. Want to start a punk band. But like, it's, <laughs> That's kind of true. <laughs> I, I, but I love it. I love it because it's just at, at its its core form, it is raw emotion. It's, it's four power chords yeah. that are super fast. And you love it, right? Like, And it's usually anti-government uh, is, is what I, I, I grew up with it as. Or, you know, just kind of like against whatever the mainstream is. I mean, punk was like the forerunner, right? Like, so right. punk would be kind of like the base of that. And then like pop punk would be a, the a, offshoot an offshoot of, of that. punk that came like later. And then emo, screamo, like all those genres. But punk like would be would be the start of that whole scene, like really, right? And they yeah. all kind of like, well, then that, like eventually the came off of the punk foundation of like Sex Pistols, Ramones, like super old yeah. school punk bands and kind of went from there. Yeah. And then I, and then I guess like punk is an offshoot of jazz. <laughs> I, yeah, I think it, right. So it's like it's so wild, true, right? Yeah. Like it's like a, it's like an offshoot of jazz somewhere. Like it, it I feel somewhere, like everything... yeah, something went very wrong back in like yeah. the sixties somewhere, <laughs> and we ended up with punk, yeah, from jazz. <laughs> but I followed the map to, and it said left. All right. I understood nothing of that. I hope the viewers understood something. Uh, <laughs> I. If you look at my, I, I I heard you guys. I don't listen to Final Fantasy soundtracks. Okay, who does oh that? <laughs> Actually, who you probably then to... listen to more music than I do because hey, like where you listen to then classical and stuff. No, I don't listen to it. I don't listen to anything. So my my Spotify playlist or my Spotify top is all Coco Melon. Okay, so that that's why I actually listen to. <laughs> but. Like if I go on a road trip or something, I don't listen to music. I I listen to either podcasts or mm. uh, audiobooks. And then I don't, I don't really feel like dead airtime. Like I, I know some people like cannot just sit at their computer and and like sit there with no sound. But like that's what I do. Like I don't, dude. I don't what I don't play music <laughs> in the background or whatever. Oh, uh, if I were to listen to something like K-pop, would probably be the closest thing. But like even then, like I'm not. I'm not a K-pop aficionado or something. I can't tell you the history of K-pop and the <laughs> eight trees or whatever, like Crim Gadoo, right? Like I, I don't know what's going on. Uh, I'm just what's your bias, person. Richard? Do you, do you have a bias? Which we, which I found out is so how you say the number one rule of K-pop is you don't say anything about K-pop because you get eviscerated <laughs> in the comments. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. If, if you poo poo on 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 K-pop, right? If if you poo poo on like like BTS or something, just by oh, mentioning no, 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 BTS, no, no, we don't say BTS. We're on we're on a list now. Right? We we're don't on say a list BTS. <laughs> we don't say anything <laughs> about this. All I know is like you say anything about K-pop and like. <laughs> People come at you and like they're like if you say anything not like normal that. fans, okay? They're, they're it's like it's like some weird stuff like happening in the K pop world. Like like stalker <laughs> level like obsessions wow. and like threats and things like that. Uh but yeah. Wow. So I don't really know anything about the K pop scene. Interesting. If you want to get frisky, then you just go online and say negative comments about insert top k-pop band and uh and things will fall like, apart quite quickly it's like the the equivalent of saying like soul ring should be banned in commander you just know you're gonna like have a interesting day on social i think media magic players if you do look that, quite yeah. civilized <laughs> yeah. compared to some of the stuff i see uh all right brendan baker 9282 why does design keep building automatic decks uh, like Amalia Life Discover, these decks perform more like an EXE instead of a two-player game. Uh, what does Wizards get out of taking gameplay out of the game? So this has been a complaint for a while. I first remember, I think there's an article from Paulo, actually, PVDDR, back during, like, energy era talking about this exact thing and how magic design had changed and been more of these like if you just put all the things that have the word on them in the same deck like you have this deck that Watsy kind of like designed for you my guess is it's just 
easier, right? That like Wizards wants the game to be more accessible for new players and building a deck from scratch is pretty hard, especially if you're brand new and you don't know the game. But if you can like put everything that says gain life on it together in a deck and have a functional deck or you just put everything that says energy on it together and you have like a functional deck, I think it makes it a little bit easier. So my guess is, even though I think it makes the game somewhat worse for like more in-depth experienced players who were like past the level of needing that, my guess is WotC does that to kind of like seed these decks for new players to get them into the deck building process and playing the game. That's the only thing that makes sense to me. First off, is what is an Amalia deck? So I imagine they're talking about the Amalia the, like combo deck, like with Labyrinth Walker. Although I don't know if that's actually a very good example of how I read their question because that deck, like, that's not that obvious, right? That's just like a combo, and you had to figure out how to support it or whatever. So I don't know if I agree with the example that well, but. Oh, okay, because I was like, did something happen in Standard overnight where Amalia popped off? Like, hold on. Oh, no, I'm like, be talking frantically. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm like frantically looking. I'm like, what is going on? Hold on. All right. Uh, I, I mean, so like, what they're, I, I'm assuming how they phrase their question, this is a why do face roll decks exist, right? The ones that where you just kind of press buttons and it just the, the deck does its thing, right? I think they mean like decks that put themselves together. And I, I would say right. like most commanders released like uh, fit this bill, right? It's like play like, I don't know, like here's a werewolf thing, right? You just only play werewolves and your commander is like super OP when you play werewolves. So it's obvious that all you need to do is play werewolves. You just put all the werewolves in, play your commander and then like attack, like, you know, there's some condition like attack. And then there, there's, like, no deck choices, really, right? Your deck choice is, like, does the card say werewolf on it? Then you stick it in your deck, really, right? And, like, that's kind of it. Versus, like, old-school commanders that did some weird, non-obvious thing and looked like they all looked like trash. And then you needed to work really hard to build a cohesive deck. And then, you know, there, there's some payoff, right? Like, your deck is actually good because you thought of XYZ synergies and you found this card from five years ago that also was trash, but now it looks good. Like, like, I don't know, like think of a, a storm deck or something, which is basically a collection of all unplayable cards, but together they somehow like work like led, right? Like you, you figured out the led, uh, infernal tutor combo or whatever, right? Like that, that's the only way to get this to work, right? With past in flames or, or whatever, or breach or something, right? Like something like that versus, I don't know literally any commander they released <laughs> right like play birds <laughs> yeah, attack but, with birds profit right or, yeah like the shrine commander is a really good example that one's like super popular but it's pretty obvious how you build it right you like look for literally every card that says shrine on it and you put it in the deck and the end result is you're gonna have a functional deck so yeah i think we've gone more and more that direction hmm i guess like yeah like that I don't know why that that exists and why those decks exist. The the autopilot decks, right? Like the, I think that it's good to have varying difficulties though across the board when it comes to having like like decks across the game. Like that, sometimes it's nice, right, to just be like, I'm gonna play a deck that pilots itself. I uh I or or sometimes I want to turn my brain on, so I'll play something a little harder to pilot and difficult. So I think that they the it makes sense that there are a few of these decks. But if the meta ever became all autopilot decks, like truly where every deck just is autopilot, that would be miserable. So I, I, I don't know. I have to imagine there's no way, right? There's no way they turn. I guess I don't want the monkey's pot to crawl. I don't want to jinx anything <laughs> here. But like, I, I really hope it never becomes where truly it's all autopilot decks. Right now that there are a few autopilot decks, things that put themselves together, I think that's fine. It's it, it's okay to have those decks and those those archetypes build themselves, right? Uh, it's but but like what's once magic is only loaded with those that I think is uh, going to be a concern. So for right now, I guess I don't really mind it. All right. Uh. Choingler, what do you think standard looks like if there's no online singles market? The recent discourse about vendors at the RC not having LCI and commons makes me wonder if such a future isn't too far off. I mean, the game just without the online singles market it would not be anywhere near what it is currently, right? Like without the ability to just like easily get the cards you need. 
on the other hand, like the LCI uncommon thing is kind of silly because hasn't it always been like that? I don't know. Did you ever have the expectation that you were going to go to like some big event and get like the random common that's worth 25 cents from a vendor? Like who travels with those? They don't like tra they got to travel across the country with all these physical cards. It's just not like worth it to bring them around. So I thought the LCI thing was like kind of a weird argument because I just don't think you can expect vendors to carry every random like common and uncommon to an event. But I think the singles market's like essential for the game like unless we somehow completely reverse course and ended up being like a living card game or like wizards completely changed their model like without the singles market i don't think standard would be a format at all really and i think it applies to most other formats too i actually hope that we at some point right like like if if we were to become like a no online singles model or anything like that it would just you know, how would we acquire cards is very easy seth it would be Yu-Gi-Oh! Battle City rules. You duel people on the streets for their rarest card. That's, that's called anti. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, bring yeah back it's called anti. anti. Yeah. yeah. You go Yu-Gi-Oh! Battle City rules. You stand on the corner of the street. You uh, you dramatize every single action you take. And then you're like, now I've won. I'll take your best card or whatever card I want. <laughs> and that's it. No, like, like I, I and, and also the, I didn't even know there was discourse. I, I, I guess I never know when there's discourse. So, but I will say that to the discourse of uncommons, it's what Seth mentioned, right? Like, I don't think a vendor is going to bring 20 cent cards because then they have to mark it up to a dollar flat, right? And then, the, and then, how much of that are they going to bring? Because it's like, how many people are are actually looking for this, right? Because they want to actually bring cards that hit a certain price threshold with them. So, I don't know. I mean, I, even like dollar rares, you can't even get. But yeah, yeah. My, yeah, my big pro tip is find the vendor with home field advantage. So usually, yeah. like some vendor is actually located at that you know, wherever your magic con or event is taking place. And they yeah. might actually have a truck filled with bulk <laughs> that uh, they can either pull for you immediately, or maybe they can pull it the next day for you or something, or, you know, they can get it from their store and they can get it to the, the site like quickly. Uh, so that'd be your best bet. But like buying like $1 cards, $2 cards, like is very difficult, let alone like 20 cent cards or five cent cards or whatever. Like it's just not worth the space for them to carry it with them. Even deeper pro tip, uh, there's probably LGSs in the place where you're going to the Magic Con. Like, we're going to Chicago in, like, a month. And I we mentioned last cast that, like, Nerd Rage Games was one of the people that was still broadcasting tournament magic, doing feature matches. And they reached out to me, like, hey, we're in Chicago. When you come to the Magic Con, you should, like, come check out our LGS. So I'm going to, like, try to stop and see that. So you might have the opportunity... If the Magic Con itself didn't travel with the cards, there might be an LDS that's like a short Uber away that you can run down and get those cheap cards and come back to the event. Ooh, I want to go. Hold on. I, I want to go to uh, Nerd Rage Games. I didn't know they were there. Also, I want yeah, we'll to go check out Nerd Rage. Yeah, okay, we'll, let, we'll let, go let's... check them out before the event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see if they have One Piece cards, too. I need, I need a... <laughs> <laughs> Your One Piece. Those are kind of on a scarcity right now, so I'm trying to find those. <laughs> uh, okay, Mr. Malorian. Commander Masters had the monocolor commanders counting... Uh, as having partner, do you feel this should always be a thing? No, <laughs> very, very much no. If come in, uh, partner is like the most broken mechanic. I cannot even imagine how broken the format would be if you could just partner any mon monocolor commander. Like partner is already broken and they designed like 20 of them specifically for this mechanic. It, what if there were thousands of partners? It would be a mess, right? Wouldn't it be horrible? I mean, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, because it's not balanced. But, like, Doctor Who has, like, a million partners. It's fine. Uh, but if you start taking together, like, tier one mono color commanders and mashing them together, it's probably disgusting. Uh, I don't just do it the, the the color restriction. I don't know. Like, there's always this weird thing where, like, people want the color restriction, but not really. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. So, like I don't know. Like, what, what commander do you even have a color identity rule like what if you just played whatever you want with your commander is that what people are wanting or do people are, want the extra synergy in the uh in the command zone oh yeah maybe color identity doesn't even matter <laughs> maybe we just get maybe we get rid of it <laughs> i don't it really think it doesn't matter that. because wizards is bending the color pie just to make it not matter right like yeah they're, they're giving every color access to everything which in a way is bending the color pie but you could just not have are you to saying that, that you're, you're, you'd be okay if everything every deck could just be five color essentially why not 
dude because then, mean, then, then like think about what would happen in like some of the the, the strategies that like exist they're, they're just gonna have they're just gonna have what, okay what, what, what about cards. this you can only have man or something like in your color identity and but you can have any cards and when you play or activate like off color cards you pay like two extra mana or something and that would actually fix all design instantly because that's what we do anyway right like white gets the real wrath and then uh, when we want red to get a wrath or something, we just like add more mana on it to make it balanced because red can't be as good as white. And then that's a new card. What if we just did that intrinsically? You could play farewell in mono red, but it costs you eight. <laughs> right? And like, I don't know. I don't I mean, think that, 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 that's going to work. <laughs> yeah, that sounds real bad, dude. But then otherwise, sounds... everyone's going to be like, well, why does white get farewell? I want farewell in black. And then we'll just be like, okay, well, uh, we'll make it black by you sacrifice <laughs> everything and you yeah. choose between artifacts and enchantments and then the exile the exile is a black thing too okay and then there you go yeah. we made black farewell like what's the point of that right yeah. just keep farewell in white it, it's farewell but you have to pay one life to cast it and now it's a black <laughs> card because you paid a life but really like the upside of color identity is you don't see the staples all the time right so that other side of this is I was already complaining about like how often I see Teferi's protection. I don't want to sit down against like Tiny Bones or uh, Orza or Cranko and then get randomly get Teferi protection or like insert whatever other staple, you know, like. So I think there is some upside to it, but yeah, I don't know. Commander's weird. Uh, but no more partners, please. No more partners. Uh, Doctor Who. Doctor Who. Those were partnered oh, with themselves, fine. though, right? Like, you have to. Dude, it's like doctors. With, like, a specific companion. set's fine. Yeah. Like, partner with my doctors is fine, or partner with is fine, but just generic, like, partner with anything. What, what about choose scary. a background? Is choose a background good? <laughs> Baldur's Gate. <laughs> I got to play more backgrounds because they didn't come on Moto for so long. I just have not played with them very much. So I actually don't know. Okay. Nona Meno Body 9083. I love end of year all fish mail episode, but I want to ask questions at other times of the year. Could you set up a way to ask fish mail questions that do not involve other websites who have a TOS I do not agree with? Uh, so even though we always put out the call on Twitter, whatever way you get questions to us <laughs> is acceptable, right? That could be email, email, that could be a contact form, that could be on stream, whatever, right? Like just, just get it to yeah. us and then we'll, we'll like jam it in. So yeah, so you, you can do whatever you want and then, you know, you can leave a comment in the YouTubes as well, like whatever, right? So just as long as it somehow gets to us, uh, we can incorporate it. Uh, Maxi Middle Tie 6090. So many random numbers. I, I feel this is a <laughs> 2024 problem. Like, can we make any accounts anymore without stringing on like random numbers? Yes. <laughs> Are there really 6,000 other Maxi Mateses <laughs> out there and you had to go that far down the, down the line? <laughs> Maybe you know what's like funny? I, I, I actually day. want, you, you know, they have like etymology books where, you know, they describe like how a word came to be, like the origins. I want to see like a timeline breakdown of like usernames, right? Because <laughs> like in 1990, you were like John Smith. You're like John Smith at Gmail. Ka-ching! And then someone's like, well, yep. I gotta be John Smith one. And then they're like, oh, John Smith eight. Now it's random. So like, oh, I'll put my birth year in there. So like John Smith, like 82 or something is the name. And like now we're, we're <laughs> up to like 60, 90. I don't know what that is. Is that just a 69 <laughs> joke with some zeros Am in I... there to make it look <laughs> cool? Not, I don't know, man. Someone else, yeah, already had 69. So I had to add in some zeros. <laughs> <laughs> all right, back to the question, though. According to you all, is it more important to be a good deck builder or a good player uh, to do well in the game of Magic? Is it the same across all formats? Thanks. Ooh. So from a spike perspective of, like, winning tournaments, I would say I know people who are not good at building decks but are really good at playing magic and they go to pro tours and win pro tours. Like you can be a very successful magic player without being a good deck builder. So I think if you had to choose from a, like I'm going to try to win tournament perspective, being a good player is more important than being a good deck builder from a fun perspective though. I would rather be a good deck builder than a good player. I think because that's where you get to put out your creativity and do all these cool things. So on a personal level, 
I if I had to choose one of those, I would be choosing deck builder. But if the goal is to win like a pro tour or something, it's got to be player, right? Like hands down, not even close. Yeah, because then you're like the the all. The problem is for you in order for you to have like the the most optimal plays, like you do kind of have to know the exact numbers of certain cards in your deck. So even if I played a deck in like absurdly well. You know, it would kind of require me to know exactly what's in the deck. So you have to some level be a decent deck builder. You don't have to be the best there ever was. So I, I do think that it is a balance of those two. So I, I, I don't know. I don't, I, I, but I would choose probably playing better or playing well than being a better deck builder, I guess. I, I actually think it's, oh, I'm going to anger a lot of people it's impossible to be a good deck builder while being a bad player it's just like straight up impossible because like if you can't play the deck how can you know what the deck <laughs> needs <laughs> like I, I don't like it just yeah. doesn't compute in my mind but there are a ton of good players that can't build decks uh and there's a solution for that your net deck right you just like yep. <laughs> grab a whoa list from whatever won the pro tour or or whatever and you're good to go and you, you'll actually see like if, if someone is extremely good at constructed and is terrible at limited that probably <laughs> hints at some deficiency in deck building <laughs> right or they just like don't want to put the time in into limited but like you know that 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 kind of shows up there somewhere <laughs> but there's like no world where you're a great deck builder <laughs> and you somehow like download the skills from like reading an article or something and then like go to a, go to pq like you can't do that but you can definitely do the opposite of downloading a deck list and and being a good player and like playing with it like extremely well um, richard you don't have to put me on blast like that <laughs> I'm awful at limited <laughs> i literally um, just force the same whatever i like and limited and that's it <laughs> Filthy casual crim. Yeah, yeah. Like, the cards I'm ruining he likes. the draft. Ruining the draft. <laughs> I'm not yeah, joking. Like, like some people, are like, oh, why would you even draft that? I was cutting you off. What? You were cutting me <laughs> off? Sick, dude. <laughs> Sick, dude. Dude, that's that's why I, I hate know. arena drafts. I hate arena drafts so much because you're not pod style in a pod. Like everyone is equally <laughs> messed up, so it's okay. But then, right, I draft with crim. And then uh, I, I have an uncoherent deck because Krim made it so. And then I play against someone who drafted in a pod where everyone walked in with real decks. And like we can't, we can't, we can't play. This is not balanced. Yeah, that is that is true. A pod uh, of Krim. Okay. So that's all the time we have for questions this week. Uh, good to finally catch up on a lot of fish mail. Uh, if you have questions, send to at mggoldfish with the hashtag mggfishmail. And of course, like we said, just find any way to get them to us if you really want, like email, uh, YouTube comments, Discord, etc. Uh, yeah, and then uh, we'll get Pro to your questions on air. Pro tip uh, for all the main goldfish crew, if you put their first name at mtdgoldfish.com, that's how you can email them. So Seth at mtdgoldfish.com, Cram, Richard, Tomer. So uh, very easy if you need to email us a question or whatever. But anyway, I believe that brings us to the end of episode 467 of the MTD Goldfish podcast. So Richard, Grim, thanks for hanging out. Thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks to Card Conduit for supporting the show. And we'll be back next week to talk about murders at Karlov Manor spoilers and whatever else goes on in the world of magic. So until then, have a lovely week, everyone. And this is a crew signing out. <laughs>